Bambini fans and welcome to one of those hard to find things on the internet, a bike review that hasn't been paid for or is shilling your best bum chum who likes to sell aluminium bike frames that snap in half and put you in hospital. Ladies, the 1.2% and gentlemen, the 98.8%. I don't have any that are unidentified, or at least YouTube metrics don't give me that information yet. I give you my time Skylon. Now they have not paid me to do this. I'm doing this off my own free will. And more importantly, I paid for the frame. So if you think it's a Hambini special, think again. Now this is my Skylon. I can't remember what size it is, but it fits, maybe a medium. It was handmade in Slovakia. Plenty of people have been wanting me to review this bike, so here it is. I will talk you through some of the bits and pieces. Now, if you do have any questions or comments, please leave them below because Time as a brand is not one that is really in the mainstream press that frequently. And let me give you an overview of what's fitted to it. Starting at the front, we've got these Dura Race levers. Uh, I've forgotten which type they are, maybe 9000, maybe 9100, I can't remember. I bought these from Merlin a few years ago, but if you are contemplating buying from them, be warned, they will do anything to avoid a warranty claim and they appear to be getting their Shimano components from somewhere other than the country distributor, which for the UK is Madison. Attached to these are some 3T handlebars. I had these um, for a while, um, they're from my old bike, um, so they're round here and arrowy here. The main advantage to having them around is I can attach anything to them, like lights, or in this case the Garmin and the hairdresser cam, which goes on here. This is the handlebar tape. It's deader tape. It's nice to stroke. I wrapped it all by myself. It's nice and tight around here. The brakes, like this one on the front, are cable operated and linked to something called calipers, which if you believe various members of the cycling marketing departments, sorry, I meant unbiased, unbribable cycling media brigade. They are completely useless and won't stop you. Now I should add, I actually own a steel touring bike with a steel fork, which I bought some 15 years ago when I was living in London. And still one of the finest bikes I've ever owned. I don't ride anymore due to narrow tires and rim brakes. This particular bike has a standard fork. You can get it with an active fork, which has a mass damper in it. This does increase the weight of the bike considerably, but apparently it makes it vibrate less. As I regularly transport my well-endowed hairdresser on my handlebars, she didn't really want the active fork. Down here, well, at the crank set, we've got half a Dura Ace 9000 and the left arm from a 9100. <laughs> we will come on to those reasons shortly. The chain, which is here, is made of something called metal. So this is the seat post. It's a sort of standard concentric aerofoil with a proper clamp, two bolt clamp on the top of it. Um, it's not a wedge type design. The seat clamp here is infinitely adjustable. I wouldn't say it's the best, um, but it, it, it works okay. I mean, the best one I've seen is an ITM Millennium, um, but that is quite a bit heavier than this. At the back, We've got a rare mech, and I was contemplating putting my absolute crap hollow cage onto it, but I'm saving that for the Christmas special, complete with guest appearance from a random Portuguese prostitute. Sorry, I meant a professor in anti-friction lube. Um, the wheels are Windspace Hyper. I generally use these or Fast Sports wheels, both very good. The seat, which lots of people slate me for, is a cell... Uh, SMP. This seat has the unusual cutout in the middle, but it's also got this beak uh, type design, which I quite like because it completely fixes your position. You can't really move forwards or backwards on it. You can only rotate. Um, it's not for everybody though. Now, I mentioned earlier on about the Dura Ace crank set. Well, in true time on a Shimano fashion, the drive side on my 9100 decided to lunch itself, live on YouTube no less. I then started to get a creak from the 9000 uh, and I traced it down to the non-drive side crank arm which has actually started to debond um, which is not really too much of a surprise the moral of this story is either buy a rotor or a 105 so let's start off with what I hate about this bike the short answer is not a lot if I was going to be really picky the headset uses some 
fairly obscure sized bearings and the only place you seem to be able to get them from is time. It's not your usual clamping affair uh, through the top cap. Um, that said, the system's actually very good because you can take the stem um, and the, uh, the top cap off and that fork won't fall out. Other issues, if like me, you're running DI2, you need another kit to have the battery clamp and a few other bits and pieces. I just put foam around my battery and then put it into the seat tube. Um, you will end up with these small holes that need some grommets to go around and um, to fill up. And obviously if you do have DI2, then you're left with what would be the cable uh, hole. And this bike doesn't have the facility with two screws to, to be able to close that up. So you need to do that. Now, five years ago, I kind of uh, would expect that to be an optional extra, but these days, I think that should be included. What's good on it? I should start off with the build quality. This thing is in a different league for manufacturing quality compared to anything else. So Cervelo, Giant, Specialized, they will look like absolute amateurs. If you're gonna have a weave type finish like this has, and you know it is a very nice finish, you have got nowhere to hide. If you've got a defect, it's there for everybody to see. Now building this, was like building a fine tolerance machine. It, it's difficult for me to put that into words, but it is extremely well made. And the geometric tolerances on this frame, how square everything is, how round the holes are, ETC, everything best in class. You'll be hard pushed to find something better than this. And this probably stems from the bike being made from, from RTM. Um, it's not a, process that most of the major bike manufacturers use. What's it like on the road? Well, I could tell you it was really compliant, very responsive and held its speed well, but it's really just a double triangle frame. The amount of damping the assembly provides is heavily influenced by the seat post and the rails. It's certainly not super flexy by any means. Of slightly more value is the handling. This is influenced by the angle of the head tube the rake offset to the front wheel, and most importantly, the effective stem length, i.e. the position you hold it at. Now I've got quite a long stem on this bike, so it's well damped. To be clear, your geometry and where you put your stem and things will have more of an effect than the factory geometry. What's it like riding the bike? Well, it is a double triangle frame. Um, and I suppose I better get some ride shots in. That is really it's a bit of a non-event really. Um, yeah. I'd say the ride is a bit on the firm side in terms of there's a lack of give in the bike because I run very high pressures, stiff wheels, stiff everything. Any of the give is really in the seat. Um, the handlebars have got a quite a long stem on them so there's a bit of give in there. I'm reluctant to use the word compliance because it's an overused term and most people don't know what it means, but it's basically damping. Um, I mean, I can't really say much about it. It's just a bike and it works. Now, a question is going to be asked is, can you feel the difference? Short answer is no. Is it any better than a 500 quid frame? Probably not, I can't tell the difference. It wouldn't be a Hambini video without a PowerPoint, would it? Well, we need to check the pen is working. The pen is definitely working today. Don't know what that time bike has done for me, but it really is working. Might work for you too. What a selling point. Makes your pen work. Right, the time Skylon, a lesson in manufacturing excellence. This PowerPoint could be quite brief. By Hambini, aged five. Uh, check me out on Patreon. In fact, that is really quite useful for me. So um, if you do sign up for Patreon, I will be very grateful. Um, on Instagram, Hambini Edge and Facebook Hambini Eng. Right, bottom bracket geometry. Well, this is the bottom bracket on the Time Skylon. Um, and if you're not familiar with how this works, basically the rounder it is, the better. And to give you some comparison, here's that famous Chinese brand Canyon to give you a bit of a thing to compare against. 
Here's some shots of the internals of this frame. The internals of it are basically better than the outside of a lot of frames. There's no real material defects. You'd be hard pushed to find something that was better made in bicycle land. The frame cost around 4,500 euros is the retail price. DI2, I salvaged, handlebars, wheels, all that. If you add it all up, it's about $8,000 worth of gear. In the world of aerodynamics, marketing is quite strong. The tarmac, which is this thing on the right, Specialized Tarmac, is rated as an aero bike, but if you're unfortunate enough to read the diatribe on weight weenies, you'll see them constantly refer to it as the fastest thing since me on top of Liz Hurley. Now, when you put it up next to the Skylon, a design that basically hasn't been changed for several years, the frames can almost be superimposed on top of each other, but there are some key differences that make the time faster. The first is obvious, you've got disc brakes, so you've got a pumping loss and the loss from having a, an additional appendage as well as the mixing loss. The other, which is not so quite apparent until I did some smoke checks, is the loss from the hoods. They are comparatively massive compared to the ones on the time and a semi-bluff body. So you get quite a big tip leakage on the top of the hood. That drag loss will depend on where you hold the handlebars too. If you are on the drops, then it is much worse. The aggravating effect, uh, effect here is the hoods are at the very front of the bike. So air that will be disturbed here uh, will be first, so you'll get the maximum penalty. For example, if you were to carry a brick, you'd want to put that brick as close to your chest as possible and not out in front of the handlebars. The reason is, near your chest, the airspeed is locally less and the shape is absorbed into your body, so the drag penalty is severely diminished. You don't have that with the uh, disc hoods because they're dangling out all the way in front of you. Even with that, both of these bikes have quite big tyre clearances uh, to the down tube, so here, oh no, well, here, that clearance is quite big. The clearance for the rear is also quite big on the Specialized, and it's not so big on the time. They're only 23 millimeters skinny tires that might put you in hospital. Now, to prove it's not a fluke, here we have the latest iteration of the Giant Propel. Note, first of all, that I'd like to say thank you to Simon from Bromley and Bike Radar for use of the picture under fair use guidance. Note the large hoods. Uh, you've got also a big clearance for the back wheel, probably a bit bigger than the uh, time. Um, and most of the gain on that bike is likely to come from the extremely wide spokes and they are extremely wide. Now to keep this objective you need to understand where the Skylon is principally not aerodynamic and that is here where my DI2 cables and junction box are. Basically the aerodynamic loss or possible gain in the handlebars and cable routing is, is where it is. The frame won't take any internal routing um, or integrated routing so you're limited in that regard now that will put some people off because the look is not clean you'll lose a few watts by having the cables and things hanging out rule number three of the aerodynamic handbook is to make something fast get rid of it i.e. make it very small so in that regard if you can get rid of the cables then do so so uh, SRAM access is probably the way forward and then finally you've got the aero engineers aero bike which is the cannondale system six on this you can see the much wider tube profiles so that one and that one specifically uh, also the ceiling around the down tube to the front wheel there is quite good and also the rear wheel to the seat tube is also good now, one key feature that you can really only get on disc brake bikes, although I've seen some on some rim brake bikes where the rim brake is actually here behind the fork, um, the top of the front tyre is almost above 
the lower headset bearing. So there is the top of the front tyre and the lower headset bearing is probably about there. Now you wouldn't be able to do that if you had a caliper in there because you'd need some reinforcement. This is the overall conclusion. Now let's start off with the paint which visually some people will buy a bike because of what it looks like. I can't really say much more about this but if there was ever a tale of if you've got it flaunt it then this is it. Raw carbon, if you've got a defect you don't have anywhere to hide. Some consumers will buy bikes based on what they look like and for a paint job I'd give it a 10. Now manufacturing quality is a league of one. The factory is their own and you are unlikely to be stung for something like a fork recall or some other mass defect. Now in my engineering guild in there Times manufacturing is highly regarded and it's something to be measured on a what is good like scale and that's kind of engineering speak for class leading what good looks like and that is kind of an endorsement that is higher than any cycling magazine will award but I should caveat that with they're not infallible so you could easily make a mistake and only time will tell as to what their customer service is like when those mistakes arise. The other point that is worthy of a mention is the technology on this bike is very much proven. There's nothing radical like a Trek ISO flow, flow, ISO floor, or a V-shape like hole like in a factor. And that's something that's often disregarded in the world of bikes. If it works, why meddle with it? Then only to go and screw it up. And bottom bracket springs to mind. You don't get any disc brake rubbing or anything like that to irritate you while you're riding so the seat doesn't slip, the handlebars don't slip, everything just works. Um, and the rest, well you can read it. Um, if you've got any questions or comments then please use the comment box below. I do read them all and try to reply to as many as I can. And that's the end of this video. If you did enjoy it, remember to smash that like button. If you didn't, go screw yourself and as always, keep banging your hairdresser.